Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is dying and death. I think it's an important topic because we're all going to die, and we've, we all have known people who have died. And uh, In my church, we believe in reincarnation and that we, we live again, and that we're also taught that the end of life is the most important chapter. Uh, and, and how we die, our state of mind when we die, is what we'll carry over in the next life. And so it's very important. At the, the end of life is very important. And in, you know, in the Western world, um, the fear of death is so strong. The suffering that people go through at the end of life is so intimidating and scary that we often uh, we, 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 we neglect the elderly, don't treat them properly, because we don't want to... It's, it's so uh, terrible to, to think about. And we really, I think, need to help the elderly at the end of their lives to hopefully, you know, they have tremendous challenges they're going through. And hopefully we can help them to be positive, to be happy, to be loving, to be humble, to be at peace, and to be, and so that they can carry that with them in their next life, their next incarnation. If people die angry, scared, depressed, then I believe they'll carry that with them, and we can we need to help them um, at this time of life. And you know all the things we do in, in today's world, and if we can't be good to the people at the end of their life, you know what's what's the point of all the things we're doing? Um, but when I was very very young, uh, growing up as a little boy, our next door neighbors were an elderly couple named the Diamonds, and. Um, Mrs. Diamond was dying of cancer, and she was on the, in a hospital bed on the first floor. Um, and my mother got to know them. They had, had, they had had only one child, a son, who was killed in the Second World War, a son named Harold. And as I grew up, little boy, two, three years old, four years old, um, my, uh, Mrs. Diamond told our mother that uh, I reminded her of her son, of their son. So my mother very kind woman. She started bringing me over. I, re- I remember coming over and standing by the bed in, in the room and this, you know, this older woman uh, talking to my mother and looking at me and in, sort of enjoying this cute little boy. And uh, she gave me a, a porcelain collie that I kept for many, many years. And you know, and then she died. Uh, and you know, I thought that was a great lesson that my mother uh, taught me because, you know, she cared about this, this dying woman next door, this old woman who had lost her son. So that was a wonderful thing that my mother did by bringing me over to stand there so she could enjoy me. Now, when I was almost 11, uh, my older sister, Pamela, died. She was, she was 16, close to 17. This was devastating to our family and because uh, it was very sudden. She got sick, very sick. We wasn't sick very long. And Pamela was very, very outgoing, very personable, energetic, creative, funny, kind. And uh, so this was a big hole in our family, a tremendous loss. And then, of course, our parents were devastated, especially. This was their daughter. And so this was really, you know, really hard on them. And I have to give my parents credit, however. They, they became better people. You know, a lot of, you know, people die at different times of, of, of life. You know, they die young, all different ages. And and there are a lot of parents who have, who've lost children. So my parents got involved in this organization called Compassionate Friends, and they started, uh, and they were very helpful. They could, they could help these people who had been so wounded by the loss of a daughter or a son. And in general, my parents would, you know, try to be helpful. They, they knew that you know, they had suffered, and they tried to uh, alleviate suffering in others and be kind to people who, who had suffered. And then my father got involved in, and he, my father was a lawyer, and he got involved in an Episcopal church court case. And uh, the result of the case is that women were allowed to become um, Episcopal ministers in the Episcopal church. Before that, they could not. It was only men. And my father partly did this for my sister Pam, who he thought, well, if she had wanted to be a minister, she would have been a tremendous minister because she was so kind and energetic and caring and a really good person. <clears throat> so. He did that. Um, in high school, I developed an interest in history and also an interest in the elderly. 
I, uh, as an Eagle Scout project in Boy Scouts, I organized uh, in our church the young people and the elderly and tried to fit them together. There were elderly people in our church, you know, who were lonely, who would want someone to visit them or needed things done around the house and, um, excuse me, and um, or need to be driven somewhere. So this is what I, I, I worked on and, and uh, as my project. And I became interested in the elderly because, um, you know, I love history and then I found, and I, I believe then, I believe now, that in general, the elderly are the kindest people in the world. You know, they've been through a lot. They've been through so much. They've yeah, they've been through so many hard times. And, you know, when you get old, when you're at the end of life, you're running out of time to, to get things right, to, to live right. And I think that, in my opinion, uh, the most important thing in life is to be kind. You know, this is the... Um, the two, two great commandments uh, that Jesus talked about, that we should love God and love each other. These are the most important things. And very often we don't do, do those things. We don't love God and love each other. But the elderly have lost, they've suffered so much, they've lost, very often they've lost their spouse, their home, and their, um, they've lost their, um, their, their health is pretty bad. And, uh, and they have all this time on their hands. They're lonely and... Um, and they, and they have physical pain. And then, you know, they get to the point, I think many of them, where they realize that kindness is what's important. And they want to give and receive kindness. And, uh, and that's, what's, that's, what, that's what's important to me. And so, so anyway, in, um, in college, I started visiting, uh, going to a nursing home, visiting with people. I enjoyed that. And then, then uh, after... Uh, when I was 24, I started working in a nursing home as an aide, and I did that for two months. And um, I worked night shift. This is 1984. I found it a pretty tough job, and uh, I found it very fulfilling, you know, working with the elderly because um, uh, I, I felt it, you know, it was meaningful, you know, trying to be, be kind to people, be, uh, care about them at the end of their life. I know when I've been sick in the hospital, I really was, you know, hoping someone would be nice to me, to be kind to me. You know, when, when you're really, and in general, if, if you're very sick, this is what you really need, you know, and you need kindness. And the elderly, this is what they need, I think, along with the uh, things that need to be done for them, the, the care, uh, the practical things that need to be done. Uh, when I was uh, then, uh, well, actually, I didn't. I did that job for a couple of months. It didn't work out. I had conflict with a, with another aide in particular, and you know, this is. I felt this other aide was too hard on the people, and, and and you know, wasn't was mistreating them, and we had conflict. And then I had my other. I had my own problems as well. So I, I stopped that job, and then um, a few moving forward. When I was my my, I had a very good father. My father John Ray, very kind man and hardworking, responsible, honest, dependable, very peaceful, very humble, calm man, good man. Of course, he'd lost a daughter. And I was, my dad was very, very important to me. And then he, he in uh, 2011, he was dying. And he died that year. So I came home uh, and I, I was, dev- it was just devastating for me. And I, I couldn't believe he was, and I couldn't, actually, I couldn't accept it. And, um, really devastating and I'd always wanted to with my father to see Cleveland win a championship you know the Cleveland Indians Browns or Cavaliers and um, and then he died and I thought oh you know that was that well we're not going to be able to do that and then so I was I was really felt horrible and very depressed I felt had a depression uh, that I felt it was and then uh, well I recovered from that depression and then the thing is um um, now, and my father's been gone now in 2011, so it's six and a half years, more than six years. And now I, I don't feel, uh, I feel I still have him. His, the memory is very, very strong. And I don't know if it's his spirit, because, you know, when he died, he, he cared about all of us. He loved us, and he didn't want to die. He loved our mother and, uh, and my brother and, and, and my sister. And, you know, he, he, you know, he was worried about us. And so... Maybe he is still helping us. I think he is because, uh, you know, we all need help. And, uh, and the memory is very strong. He had a very good example. So I think of him. And um, help, it helps me to, uh, to live my life, to live prop- properly. He was a good example, very good example in how to live. 
And, you know, he was very patient with us. And my sister and my mother and I would tend to have regrets and so forth. He would listen to us. And then and he said, well, OK, what can we do now? You know, it was interesting. He was interested in getting things done. What can we do? You know, OK, the past is over. Let's let's, let's get stuff done today. Wonderful example. When, when Cleveland Cavaliers won the 2016 NBA Finals, I thought of my father. And I thought, uh, yeah, I still had that father-son experience of seeing Cleveland win a championship. And so I, I really felt good about that. And my father loved birds. Every time I, I think of my father, I see these birds outside. Or if I smell a cigar, <laughs> reminds me of my father. Uh, in 2013, my mother was had a year to live. I I came and took care of her in the last year of her life, and that was a wonderful experience. My mother and I, did we didn't get along. We had a tough, tough relationship. We had a lot of conflict, and uh, yeah, we were both, you know, strong-willed and um, resisting each other, and it seemed like she'd get mad at me, and I'd get mad at her. But then when I came to take care of her, you know, she had really been through a lot, not only losing her daughter, but my father, you know, she lost her husband, wonderful man, had a very good marriage. He was a very good husband, and um, she lost her home, and then her, you know, physically she was pretty weak and slept a lot. So by the time I came, you know, she was at that point where she was really interested in being kind and receiving kindness, and so she, she didn't get mad at me anymore. She was, I was, we were kind to each other. It was a wonderful you know, we had about 14 months together, really good times, and I read out loud to her, got her dressed, took her to breakfast at this uh, senior citizen's retirement community, and made a lot of friends there. And yeah, and I became a part of the community. All these old people, I really loved that because they were, they were so kind, you know, so much kindness. I really enjoyed it. Wow, it was wonderful, wonderful experience. And I was with my mother, mother when she died, and um, I, was fi- I finally became a good son, <laughs> so... Then she died. So, and you know, I've had this interest in, over the years in the elderly. So, um, I finally I, t- I decided I wanted to get a job in a nursing home again. You know, I'd done this work years ago. So, if you wanted, if you want to work in a nursing home, you have to uh, you have to take a class for. Uh, it's called state tested nurse assistant, and I took this class about a three week class, and you have to pass the class, and then you have to take a, a state test. And the written part is pretty easy, but then you have these uh, these uh, things you have to do that are physical, you know, physical actions, you know, like washing your hands, which actually is is harder than you think, and and you know, all these different, I think like fifty different things you have to do, helping people out of bed, and uh, and uh, you know, cleaning them, and um, helping them walk, and these different um, skills that you need to take care of the elderly. Anyway, I passed that test. I was really, I was really happy. I, I didn't think I would make it because it's. I found it pretty tough. So I got the, uh, had my got my license, this STNA license, and then um, I started applying for work. And it took, only took me about a week before I got a job. There, there are openings. You know, definitely this is a big field. There's a lot of uh, demand for these uh, nurses' aides or nurse assistant. So I started working. This was. Uh, this this past year in April. I worked at a, a local nursing home for six months. I worked the night shift from 10.30 p.m. to 7 in the morning. And, uh, and it was a tough job. It was, it was very fulfilling. I found uh, working with uh, people at the end of their life, very tough job. You, a lot going on, I think, physically. It was very tough. It seemed, some nights I was on my feet the whole night, it seemed like. So I, was, I got really, really tired. Um, I'm 57. My, my knees got tired, my ankles, my hip, and, you know, just my, and I'd come home and fall, fall asleep. My wife would call me, and I could hardly think. I was so tired. But I, I was glad I did it, you know, and I was disappointed that I quit. I wish I, because I wanted, I believed in the work. I believe the importance of working with the elderly and working with people at the end of their life. The, uh, one of the big challenges is, uh, you know, most of the people are incontinent, which means they, you know, they're urinating, so they have to wear an adult diaper, which we call a brief, because we, you know, we don't want to embarrass them. And that led to some confusion, because you come in to change their brief, and you go, I'm here, and they don't know what you're talking about, so, uh, and sometimes you'd have to, but anyway, this is very important, because, uh, 
you know, this they have to be changed. And if they get really, really wet, this and actually, they're if they're if they're wearing them, that means there's going to be urine against their skin, you know, and. Not so bad if, if it's not too wet, but you know the wetter it gets, the more it's going to be. It could cause skin problems, severe skin problems, which could lead to uh, very terrible uh, pro- health problems. You know where the skin breaks down, and it could be you know lead to death. So this is very important work, and um, that's a big part of part of the work. I at this nursing home, one of the things in nursing homes is the r- important thing is the ratio of residents to to aides. And where I worked, it was about 12 to 14 residents per aide. Other places, it's much higher, 16 to 18. And, you know, the higher it is, the worse it is because you have all these people to take care of. And um, you can't, and that means they're not getting good care. You can't, um, and the thing is, so many of them, you know, there's so many of them are lonely. And you'd want to spend, I wanted to spend more time with each one, but I couldn't because there was more work to do. So that's a big part of the job is changing their uh, diapers, adult diapers, and um, and then um, we had to uh, get a number of. Uh, usually, we'd have to get four people, wake up four people, and get them washed and dressed. And since I left at seven, um, you know, this means we're getting people up pretty early, and uh, I didn't really like feel comfortable about. It. I had to do it, and you know, we have to do it. It's our job, and it the, the idea is to. For the first shift to, you know, since they have the bulk of the responsibility of weight getting people up, you have, you have, they have to get out of bed. They have to get, even if they can't walk, you know, they have to come out for breakfast. And it's not, we can't let, have them laying in bed all the time. And they need to be, they need to be, need to be dressed. And this takes time, you know, and four people. So I'd have to start getting people up maybe at five in the morning or earlier. And uh, if they've gone to bed earlier, maybe it's not a problem. Some of them are ready to get get up, but sometimes, you know, this was uh, this was this was this was, this was hard, and because uh, and it, it would take time. I'd have to look for their clothes, try to find clothes, and you'd have have to find clothes that f- would fit and that they could wear. And you know, getting them, it would be hard for them sometimes to uh, you know getting especially getting the sleeves in the shirt. And if they can't really sit up, you're you know they're laying in bed. It's it's tough. It, the work's pretty tough. Um, and then you're, you get them to the toilet if they can walk and get them, we get them dressed on the toilet where they could relieve themselves and wash their face, wash their up their torso. And then, you know, get to get a new, get a new diaper a new, or a new brief and, and get their clothes, put their clothes on the top and then their, their pants and, and then, uh, supposed to brush their teeth and wash and clean fix their hair and uh, get them in a wheelchair and bring them out to breakfast. And uh, it takes time. It really takes time. And uh, it'll be, a, I found the time pressure uh, real challenging. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and this, uh, and I had, since I was there, about 20 of the residents that I worked with died during that time. But it was, it was a real honor to, to work with them. Um, Aids, uh, nursing home aides are not paid well. I was, I made eleven dollars and seventy-five cents an hour, and uh, a lot of the aides are working overtime because you know they need the money. They're not being paid enough on a regular forty-hour week, and then I think you know there was it's too much for them, and they're getting tired and t- getting irritable, and it's it's a very tough job. And I don't, we don't seem to recognize in this country that the significance. It's very noble work, I think. Very, very important work. I can't think of anything more important than taking care of someone at the end of their life, but we we don't. Um, it's not recognized in our in our country today. And you know, so some of them, you know, they're very, very heavy. Some of them, and that that's real challenging. You know, you have you're trying to change their 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 diaper, and uh, they have to be roll to the side you know you, you have to undo the the clasp these uh, where the so this tape that keeps it together and push them get them on their side and that, just doing that can be hard seems like you're forever roll pushing the having the bed go up and down so you don't hurt your back you know you want you want the bed low to the floor uh when they're in bed so in case they roll out they don't get hurt but when you're changing their brief, you need to have it go go up. So there's a control. You're having it go up and down. You have to remember to put it down when you when you're when you're finished. And some of the people are so heavy. I was really having trouble. I'm not that strong physically, and you have to get them on their side to to change the brief. And 
if they've had a bowel movement, we had these wipes. It's like this that you would uh, clean, clean them with, and that's you know, we got to got to get them clean. Very very important. And if they've had <laughs> if they've had diarrhea, wow, then you've really got a lot of work, and there might be a lot. Uh, it's going to take 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 quite a while to get get them clean. And if if it's been if it's pulled up or laying on their back and it's pulled up between their legs, and if it's a woman, it might be in their vagina. They could get a urinary tract infection. So it's really Really, a lot of you got you got to make get, make sure they're clean. And you have there's this time pressure. You have all these other people to take care of, and it seemed like, uh, yeah, that that was that was tough physically. And uh, and then the, the, you know they're all different. So you're you're I was I kept on they kept putting me with different people. Where I worked, there was probably maybe 90 residents, two long term units, one rehab. In the rehab, some of the the people would be come and go. They're just there for a short time. They have their call lights, which they uh, press, and then you you really, I was, I keep that in mind, or I would, you know, try to get there as soon as I could, but if you're getting people up in the morning, you're busy with someone, you can't uh, answer the call light, because it's, uh, because you're, you're, you have to finish what you're doing, that person has to wait, and so that's, that's tough. Some of the people would get up, you know, uh, we'd have alarms that would go off, that, because you were worried someone would get up, and we were always worried about people falling, getting hurt. <clears throat> so if an alarm would go off, then you'd have to, you know, really move fast. You'd have to get there because you don't want them to, to fall. And if you, let's say, usually they're getting up to go to the bathroom. They don't use the call light. And then so you come and help them in the bathroom and they're on the toilet and you're waiting for a while. And then maybe another alarm goes off and you think, oh, wow, what, what am I going to do now? Because, uh, you don't want to leave a guy alone on the toilet, and sometimes you had to, and I'd tell him, like, please, please just don't get up, because <laughs> you have, there's another alarm I had to go and, and check on. So, yeah, that was challenging, the the, the people, the, how, how heavy they, they might be, and, um, uh, and then you're trying to, the thing is, you get an assignment, every, I get my assignment, and uh, the longer I was there, I pretty much got to know everybody, all the residents and patients. And um, you, the thing is, you're, you want to figure out if, you know, some of them, maybe they'd sleep through the night. Some of them could go to the bathroom on their own. You know, they could go on. And others, you know, would really uh, would you call use the call light. So maybe we would help them with a walker, get to the bathroom, or, um, and sometimes they're, they change their, have to change their brief. Um, and when we, when you start your shift, you have to get the laundry cart set up with the fresh laundry, clean laundry, the, uh, the sheets and the bottom sheets and the, these pads we'd put under them in case the, the diaper leaked and, uh, towels to wash them, uh, rubber gloves. We're always, you always have to put on rubber, new rubber gloves when you go in a room and these, these wipes, if you're to wipe them when you're cleaning their, uh, diaper or changing the diaper. And, uh, yeah, all these, and then you'd have another uh, like a cart for uh, garbage, one for garbage, other for for uh, dirty laundry. And uh, after you've, uh, when and sometimes you know if you uh, who knows what's maybe ever all everything has to be changed and they're bedridden, so you have to change the bottom sheet and, and the pad and the top sheet, maybe even the blanket, and maybe, maybe their gowns wet. Yeah, all this and it's it's really a lot of work and. Um, I really, I found it very, yeah, it was tough. I was really, I was over, it was overwhelming, all the, all the work that needed to be done. And, um, and you know, the suffering, you're, you're witnessing, you're, you're witnessing people's suffering and you're, and you're, you're, you're you participate in it. You're a part of it. And because the people are very often, they're in despair. And uh, sometimes you're going in to change their brief, their diaper, and they're, you know, the, they don't want to wake up. You know, they're sleeping deeply. And I, I've been very depressed myself. I think many of these people are depressed, the elderly. And so sleep's the only relief they can get. And you're coming and you're waking them up at 3 in the morning. And uh, they're like, what are you doing? And they don't even maybe realize that they this need they need to have a new brief, a new diaper. So they're like, no, leave me alone. You know, go away. What's wrong with you? And and so you really, at that point, you almost, you, you have to do it. and Because if, if you don't, change their diaper and so you're imposing your will, then they're going to get really wet. And this is bad. This is really, it's bad for their health, for their skin. And then you have, you're going to have a lot more work later because everything's going to be wet. And, uh, yeah, so, um, 
And, and then the thing is, they're, if they're so defiant, maybe you have to get help, uh, and the nurse, the other aides. And the thing is, everybody's kind of busy, so you're, it's kind of, you're kind of expected to solve this problem yourself. And you, know, you have to try to use psychology. Sometimes I would try to be kind to them, you know, be patient and say, I've really got to do this. But sometimes you'd have to be, <laughs> I didn't like it, but you'd have to be saying, I, I've got to do it. Be a little bit, not, not hard, but a little bit firm, like, I have to do this. We have to do this. So this is really something. Some of the, yeah, and they're, they're suffering. They're, uh, you know, you have people, this one lady, she kept saying, oh, God, oh, God, over and over. And, and well, she died, and, and she was been really suffering. And uh, I just couldn't stay with her, you know, that long. I had other people to take care of. There are people with feeding tubes. I don't agree with this, but it's something that's done. You know, if they can't, they, st- they, they can't swallow or they have no appetite, and this is done. Sometimes the feeding tubes leak, and then you have to clean everything up. Uh, some of the men, I would have to shave in the morning. That takes time because, you know, the, fold, the folds of their skin are very loose, and you don't want to cut them, so that you really have to, that, that's going to uh, take time. And, uh, yeah, and these people have different issues that they're going through, um, I, you know, this one lady, uh, she, I put the bedpan on wrong, and oh, she was, got so mad at me. I got yelled at by a number, quite a bit, by by <laughs> by residents and other aides who I guess they thought I was screwing up. And uh, but this one lady, yeah, she got so mad at me. But later, uh, we became very good friends, and uh, and she didn't. She and she and her husband, we were very. I was very close to them, and she we had a very positive relationship. That's why I took the job because I wanted to have. You know friendships with these people, and I found I could very have with her. We had a very positive interactions. You know that I was like a son to her, and you know it was very kind. And you know we, we talked about stuff, and and then uh, actually I came in. She she had died, and um, yeah I found her, and a uh, good thing I she hadn't been she hadn't been dead too long, and so this is this is tough. You know that, but you know it's in a way it's good because um, when depending on how difficult their life had been you know death is a blessing it's not the end and their suffering is over what they this nightmare that they've been through i sometimes i call the work of a aide in a nursing home you're in shit misery and death because uh it's it's pretty tough but it's it's fun actually yeah i had fun with people with um you know it's uh having making friends with them and uh but it's it's also it's it's heartbreaking work heartbreaking because you, you know in fact you don't want to hurt them sometimes you actually you're hurting them because just moving hurts and they have to move to change their brief and they have to move to get dressed I can have some of the people I was what might hurt their shoulders to get you know put the sleeves and their shirts on so you're looking for clothes that would be relatively loose if you could find them some of them had these colostomy bags which are when the um you know, their bowel doesn't work, and then the uh, solid waste is coming out through their side into a bag, and you got to check that. And you actually have to check that sometimes a lot of gas would go in that, and you have to make sure you, you open it up and let the gas out. Otherwise, it's um, it might pop. It might explode. And if it fills up with a lot of, uh, you know, fecal matter, that really has to be, that has to be changed. So these uh, colostomy bags have to be, you know, they have to be emptied. We pour hot water in it, or warm water, to try to loosen up the material. Um, we have this charting we have to do, is uh, where you uh, have a computer, and you're charting. The main thing is, is you know, that if they've, that they've had bowel movements, that needs to be charted, because if they're constipated, you know, this can lead to health problems, where, uh, you know, and they, should, they need something to help them to, to move their bowels, so that needs to be, that's really important. Uh, and if they stop urinating, that's also important. Otherwise, a lot, of, a lot of the charting, I think, was kind of a waste of time. But you have to do it. It's part of the job. We, we change water pitchers. Uh, I gave, sometimes I'd, I'd give a shower to a resident. Again, to help the first shift that has, has more work. Although with first shift, they have more aids as well. So we'd give a, give a shower, get the people, get their clothes out, and uh, do that. So it was... Uh, this is really something. The uh, this this job, um, the uh, what they're going through.
what these people are going through. And, you know, the aides, the people who do this work, you know, you have to give them a lot of credit. And um, there were times when I I didn't like how they were treating the, the residents. But the thing is, I you know, I quit. I only did it for six months. And this work needs to be done. You know, this these people, they need care. They have to, they have to have, they need... Um, you know they're helpless. They have to. They have to wear these diapers that have to be changed, and they need help getting dressed. They need help, uh, you know, getting to getting to eat, getting to to, to to for meals. Sometimes they need help of uh, being fed. They have uh, some of them. They have this. Uh, they they can't. Um, they don't. Have, some of them can. You know, stand. They're all different levels of ability, and or where they can stand and to get in a wheelchair. But others can't do that. So there's this. Two different types of lifts: the sit to stand lift, that, where they have some strength, and yet, but they have to be, you know, uh, rigged up in this lift to get them in the wheelchair. And then some of them have no strength at all. And there's a, the Hoyer lift where you lift, they're lifted up and put in a wheelchair. And so, that takes, that's not easy. There's a lot of skills. There's a, this takes a lot of skill. And um, so the people who do this type of work for long term, you have to give them a lot of credit and. I think that yeah, they should be paid better, and there should be more aids per person. Where I worked, it was a nonprofit, so they had a much better ratio of uh, aids, a lower ratio of aids to uh, of, of residents to aid aids, which is better. And other places, a nursing homes for profit, you know, they minimize the aids, and then it's the care is, is definitely not that good because you know it's just, there's just so much work. If you have 18 people and and, you know, with people, they, they push their call light and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And then, you know, they um, who knows how long it's going to be before someone will come because there aren't enough aides. And uh, so it's really something. It, it was an honor for me uh, to be with the pe- these people at the end of their life. And I, I, you know, I feel like we need to have uh, more of a sense of people going into this work as a humanitarian reasons because actually a lot of the aids it's just it's a job you know they they uh you you know there you don't need college you just need to take this this short class and take the test and then you do the work but a lot of them were really really good it it's i think they're demoralized because you know their pay is so low and the work is it's it's an overwhelming job with this this tragedy that you're dealing with people at the end of their life and the suffering that they they're going through but uh and, you know, this, this one lady, she kept saying, no, 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 over. And I tried to, she, but uh, you can calm, much of the time I could calm her down and get her to stop doing that because uh, uh, it's disturbing. You feel bad when you hear somebody doing that. And, uh, yeah, some of them are, you know, they're just, they, they're not thinking properly and then they don't, they're suspicious of you. This one guy wanted to fight me. I don't know. He thought I was somebody else. He'd been in, he'd been in Vietnam. Um, I've had some, you know, real positive relationships. You can have some fun and talk with them. Talk about the old days when they were young. I get, I got in trouble sometimes. I talked too much to people and then, and maybe a call light was going on and I didn't get it. Um, and because uh, I was talking to someone who someone who's very lonely and wanted to talk, and uh, so it's 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 a real it's really something this type of work and it's it's important I really believe in it and uh, it's, it's really tough I think mentally I kept all the things you're supposed to do you know you you're coming in getting your assignment and you check on check on the alarms make sure the alarms are on and. Uh, um, you, you really, they, they need to have, if they're going to the uh, bathroom, they need to have some of these non-skid socks so they don't slip getting in the wheelchair. And uh, and then you're, the supplies, maybe there's no briefs in the room. You have to go, go get them. And um, a lot there's really a lot to it mentally and uh, psychologically. You know, you really feel for them that they're suffering, what they're going through at the end of their lives. And, um, and physically, very, very tough. So I think as a country, we need to have the courage to face this issue, face dying and death, and do a better job. You know, the elderly, people at the end of their life should, should receive good care, and they should, be, they should receive kindness. They shouldn't be lonely. They should not be mistreated. They should not, not be treated like children, uh, like, like bad children, or as if they're crazy. You know, they, they should be respected. 
and I, I really believe in this. And uh, maybe if I can uh, develop some strength, you know, when I quit the job, I I thought, well, maybe I'll try it again, and maybe I will. I don't know. We'll see. Because it was, uh, I, I became, I was really overwhelmed by the whole thing and became pretty unhappy, and that's why I, I stopped stopped working. I wanted to mention four books that I read that deal with the elderly. The first is Another Country by Mary Pfeiffer, Ph.D., 1999. This is an incredible book. It's about middle-aged people and their elderly parents. Uh, We've lost our sense of community in America. You know, people have uh, moved around so much, you don't have these towns where neighbors know each other, extended family and neighborhood. So, and then there's this, we have what's called age segregation, where there's very often... In the old days, you'd have all ages would, would know each other, the very old and the very, very young. And now we don't do that so much uh, because there's, uh, it just doesn't happen. You have, you have elementary schools with all uh, kindergarten kids, and you have nursing homes with all old people. So we need, it's, I think it's really good if we could uh, reconnect uh, all ages, uh, and especially the elderly with children. We need each other. The next book is The Courage to Grieve, Creative Living, Recovery, and Growth Through Grief by Judy Tannenbaum, 1980. Uh, The next one is One More Time Just for the Fun of It by Effie Leland Wilder, 1999. This is about life in an old folks home in South Carolina. It deals with aging with a sense of humor and wisdom. And uh, the last book is Life Instead by Diane Bringle, 1979. The author's husband and three children were killed in an airplane crash, and she was severely burned. But she went on to have a wonderful life with God's help. So we should have, we need courage to face uh, dying and death. You know, it's, it's scary. You go into a nursing home, and you think, oh, my God. And you get this, it might smell urine, and you see all these people in wheelchairs just sitting there, and they're in despair, many of them. And you think, oh, my God, it's terrifying, and you don't want to go back. And, very often, people avoid go, going to nursing homes unless they absolutely have to, unless it's their mother or father. And see, w- w- that's wrong. We need to have courage to go in and, and face this face this situation. And because uh, otherwise, as we were, I was at an NBA game, Cleveland Cavaliers basketball game, twenty thousand people, all these people there watching this game, and all the food, and this is winter, all the effort it goes into. And I think the United States is an amazing country, but I feel. We as a people, uh, if we can't be good to the elderly, if we can't be kind to them and take good care of them at the end of their life, and th- then, then what's the point of everything that we do? You know? So anyway, well, I've talked too much. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.